Hello and welcome to Weymouth. Weymouth is better known for its visits by George III, of course, and in latter times the Olympics. But we're here today to find out more about the fascinating medieval history of Weymouth with the author of this book, James Crump. And the interview is going to take place in this local, very ancient pub behind me called the Boot Inn. So come on in and we'll find out more about medieval Weymouth. Hello and welcome to today's show. We're filming this from the very old Boot Inn in Weymouth in Dorset. Fascinating for me, it's my hometown, so I'm absolutely thrilled. And we're here with author Jim Crump, who's written a really interesting book, fascinating book, on medieval Weymouth, which I think you will all enjoy so much finding out more about this historic place. And of course, Weymouth is much better known for George III's influence um, in latter times, obviously, the Olympics, but it was really important in medieval times and Jim has spent many many years researching the evidence that goes into this book so we're thrilled to have you here today welcome Thank you. and on this um, in this site here of the boot in which is also a very old building very atmospheric building so it's great to be here so Jim welcome to our to our show well, could you first of all tell me what inspired you to write this book about medieval Weymouth many years ago I uh, worked in teacher education and a group of us were trying to introduce local history to the school curriculum. Um, my main uh, part of that was to do research to uh, produce teaching materials basically on uh, the history of towns. Right. So I uh, researched in a lot of towns, uh, all really, uh, across the country. Um, in Lincolnshire, uh, Horncastle in Lincolnshire, Shrewsbury in Shropshire, Guildford in Surrey, Ludlow in Shropshire, uh, Doncaster in South Yorkshire. Uh, actually developing and, and producing and producing materials. So I got quite a strong background in, in urban history. Yes. Uh, then we came to Weymouth and uh, as you said, uh, anyone coming to Weymouth, the first thing that hits you is uh, George III mm. and uh, Weymouth uh, is, uh, the impression is that Weymouth is George III um, but uh, when we came here, um, walking around in uh, really in the old town because actually everything south of the King's statue is the old Weymouth, mm -hmm. the, the port, the port centre of Weymouth. <laughs> Uh, it hits you straight away, that, or it hit me straight away, having that background, uh, that this is a planned medieval town. Uh, so that's what began it. Uh, ah, okay. And uh, doing field, bits of field work, followed that up, uh, trying to locate documents and do the sort of uh, related documentary research. That's how it all started, um, uh, out of a really long-standing interest. Ah, so when you say a planned medieval town, does that differ, say, maybe from somewhere that may have had perhaps a Saxon church and a village grown up around a Saxon church? Do you mean by a planned town it was a decision yes. to put yes. the town here? Yes, what you say is quite, is quite correct. Um, towns sometimes sometimes grow uh, because uh, they're associated in Dorset particularly uh, associated with great monasteries like yes. Sherborne or yes. uh, um, CERN. yeah uh, or in in the case of the towns Wim Sherborne Wimborne Shaftesbury right. all huge uh, monastic establishments there mm -hmm. and the activities that went on around in and around the monasteries uh, led to the development of, of, of towns in yes. those sorts of places. Also, fortified areas like where, where um, the the fact that you, it was a, a sort of fortified place provided security for trade and things like this, right. uh, that kind of thing. Mm. And in a sense, uh, what what uh, the implication is of what you just said is that these towns are sort of organic. They just yes. they just grow up. They just evolved. Yeah. Uh, but with some Dorset towns, uh, towns like Poole, uh, Weymouth, Malcolm. Um, they were actually obviously they there were settlements 
which uh, were sort of nondescript things. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, small fishing communities, things like this, which go back a long way. Yeah. Uh, but um, as, as towns, as we think of towns, they were actually deliberately developed. Right. Uh, and that began, that process began in the, uh, in the 13th century. Right. Uh, in the sort of 1250s, the crucial times, the 1250s for Weymouth and the 1280s for uh, Malcolm Regis. So if we, if we kind of go back to the fact that some people may not know that actually what we think of as Weymouth yeah. was in fact two different towns. Yeah. So if anybody has been to Weymouth itself and been on the lovely Weymouth beach, that was actually called Malcolm Regis. Yes. And then we've got the harbour coming through. And then on this side where we are now was actually the town of, of yeah. Weymouth. And both were very different, weren't they? So who, who were the founding fathers of each? each side of the, of the uh, harbour or the river? In the case of Weymouth, it was uh, a large monastery in Winchester, right. uh, St Swithin's Priory, which was also uh, quite a big business. And it was the pri two priors of, uh, of the monastery in the 1240s, 1250s. Uh, one was called John de Cors, uh, but uh, uh, the second one, a uh, much more important one, uh, was William of, William of Taunton. Right. And they deliberately set out to develop Weymouth as a port. Uh, it was a pretty nondescript fishing community, I suspect. Mm. Uh, it, it does, in the neighbourhood, there are all kinds of uh, uh, Roman references and mm. so on. Uh, but uh, I suspect that uh, before the developments that we're talking about, uh, Weymouth was a, a fairly nondescript fishing place. Yes. Uh, but the monastery uh, decided that uh, it was going to develop it to produce income which uh, the monastery would use because the monastery was attached to Winchester Cathedral. Yes. And, and was Winchester the capital of England at that time? Sorry? Was Winchester the capital of England uh, at that time? Not, no. No, that, that was, was a, a bit earlier, that was yes. Earlier. Um, the, they were going to use, uh, uh, develop the town to uh, produce income to support the cathedral. This, is, this was their aim. Uh, yeah. on, <coughs> on the uh, Malcolm Regis side, the developers uh, were the king and queen. King Edward I uh -huh. and his uh, consort Eleanor of, Cas uh, Eleanor of Castile. And the idea there was again to develop uh, Malcolm Regis as a port and uh, actually uh, the king hoped that uh, Malcolm Regis would, would be the source of a, an independent income for the queen uh, right. who was uh, uh, had lots of relatives. Uh, and uh, hangers on, right. and uh, he was anxious not to uh, have to uh, put too much into support. <laughs> okay, so it would give so some income to, the to idea Eleanor. Was that she okay. had that she had uh, manners. Uh, which um, would basically support her. So hence she, the name Malcolm Regis. Malcolm Regis, mm. yeah. Uh, she was a very, very clever woman, very, very cultured woman, but also a very acquisitive, greedy woman. Oh, OK. Uh, and uh, there was a little verse going around at the time. Um, uh, <coughs> the king... Uh, the king desires to get our gold, something like this. The king desires, this is Edward I, the king desires to get our gold, the queen our manners fair to hold. Uh, what she did was uh, she got control of, uh, of people's debts and then uh, used the debts as a lever to get hold of their manners and build up a quite substantial oh estate of which Malcolm Regis was part. Right. Uh, so that's how that started. They were. 
not a very nice couple, but no, um, no. Uh, obviously a, affectionate. They had uh, either 14 or 16 children, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> they were well suited. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And then um, going back to Weymouth, then we had the Dukes of Gloucester involved, yeah. didn't we? And their, the Earls their of Gloucester, money, Earls Earls of Gloucester, Gloucester sorry, involved. Yeah, the Clare mm. family. Yes, uh, yeah. Who uh, they obtained quite soon after the uh, initial impetus was put in by uh, uh, William of Taunton. The Clares obtained Weymouth by uh, exchange. Right. And uh, I think, I mean, the, the Clares were, the Clares built towns, um, often quite, uh, quite sort of specialised towns to produce things like uh, armaments. Right. Uh, not th that wasn't the case in Weymouth. Mm. No. Uh, um, their main, I think, their main contribution to the subsequent development of Weymouth was that they seemed to have encouraged the wine trade, right? Which was uh, extremely important mm. in Weymouth. Mm. So that, yeah, that was their link. And did the Clares have <coughs> um, much involvement with the Knights Templar of the time? I, I don't I couldn't really say no about that. no uh, but presumably yeah, money would have yeah. gone across for the Crusades yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe yeah. that was uh, part uh, yeah. of their money um, so okay so we've got <coughs> both the towns are starting to be set up and how did they join because pr there was no bridges then how, how would people have crossed from uh, place well, to place uh, that's a really quite important thing about about uh, Weymouth and Malcolm Regis. Mm. They were quite distinct towns. Uh, they were often in conflict uh, over control of the harbour. Right. Uh, the only means of actually getting across the harbour from uh, one to the other uh, was a rope ferry. Okay. Uh, 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 in, in effect, uh, uh, a boat crossing towed by uh, rope. Um, that when when that actually began, I don't know. It was certainly in existence uh, at the beginning of the 16th century when uh, when Leyland came and right. described the town. Yes. But when that actually originated, I, I don't know. No, um, no. In order to get, uh, let's say, a cart from uh, Weymouth to Malcolm. Mm then uh, you'd have to take it all the way around by Radipole and then all the way back. Okay. Uh, so that would be yeah. a journey of maybe four or five miles. Right, because the waterfront isn't like you see it now. Such a lot of the land has been reclaimed, hasn't yes, it, since indeed. medieval yeah. times. Yeah. So um, it, the water would have come almost, I suppose, right up to the outside of the, the, the pub where we are now yeah. sat. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's true. And yeah. we'll, um, we're going to show some shots of where the rope bridge would have been. So what would have medieval life been like for the average person? You know, if there had been maybe a trader coming to Weymouth, what would they have been met with? Well, uh, in this period, especially in the, uh, in the 14th century, uh, which was the time of the Hundred Years' War, mm. which had a massive effect on the two towns, they were very violent places, um, uh, not simply uh, because uh, they had large uh, sort of transient populations as you'd, as you'd expect yes. in uh, uh, port towns, yes. uh, but um, because the, the impact of war uh, on the towns uh, usually took the form of, of raids. It's very difficult to actually establish when uh, specific raids mm. uh, uh, took place uh, on, on Weymouth and Malcolm. Mm. It's known that, that uh, they were attacked. On, and where would these a, ships have come from? Where would these people have come from? Uh, well, the, the uh, raiders were mostly uh, uh, French, uh, uh, Bretons, Normans, uh, some Galicians, mm -hmm. uh, some Genoese. Um, these were mercenaries which uh, were uh, manning fleets which right. were organised by the French kings mm -hmm. uh, and uh, attacking shipping in, uh, in the Channel was one way of actually, uh, one way the French certainly could operate uh, uh, against the English. Yeah. Um, as I say, the, the the actual it's very difficult to document uh, the the raids. Um, possibly, 
the late, thir the late, very late 1370s, after the death of Edward III, right. uh, or the 1380s, right. in the reign of Richard the uh, Richard II. Uh, but uh, you get lots of petitions from, uh, especially Malcolm Regis, to the Crown asking for relief from taxation, asking okay. for uh, abatement of what was called the fee farm, which was what the town actually paid to the Exchequer. Um, oh, okay. And uh, all the time in, uh, in, in these petitions, uh, the request is, as I said, to reduce taxes, to reduce the fee farm because we're in a terrible state because of, because of the war. Uh, and the implication of that was that the Crown was a bit responsible for it, so uh, right, they ought so to they do should be paying it, less. Yeah. So what we've got is is um, an area that really wasn't known of before the two towns were planned here to something that was worth raiding. Yes. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, I know that there were certain charters, and Weymouth had its charter yeah. before Malcolm Regis. So could yeah. you tell us a little about when that was and what the charter involved? Why they were given a charter? What that meant they could do? Well, William of Taunton's charter was. Uh, well, Let's start with John de Cause's charters. Uh, they were in uh, 1248, 1251, and essentially they were about getting permission to have markets. Right. Uh, because you needed to, you needed uh, authority uh, to hold uh, okay. a market, and you got that by charter. Uh, William William of Taunton, uh, with his charter, was basically. Uh, a method of setting up the town. Uh, what he did was uh, to declare that uh, Weymouth was a free borough. Uh, what that meant exactly what it said really, uh, that uh, the, the people, the burgesses, uh, it was because it was a borough, its okay. principal inhabitants were bur bur right. known as burgesses, uh, that the Burgesses had certain rights uh, and certain privileges, uh, especially security of, of tenure of their properties, right. and trading privileges, uh, which he said should be equivalent to people in uh, merchants in Southampton and Portsmouth. Okay. This was to uh, equip uh, uh, Weymouth merchants to, com to actually compete with, with towns like that. Mm. Uh, also, uh, the the charter, uh, the Weymouth Charter, gave all kinds of uh, let's call them sweeteners uh, to uh, actually attract people into the town. Uh, this was one of the big things about about charters like that. Uh, so, for example. Um, uh, people who broke uh, the assize of ale, let's uh -huh. say. Uh, the assize of ale was a means of, of regulating uh, the production and consumption and, and sale okay. of ale. Uh, ale, of course, was the, was the staple drink. The yes. water was yeah, too bad the water to was drink dodgy. Yes. Wine was too expensive. Yeah. No tea, no coffee, no nothing like that. No. Uh, so ale. Uh, so the, the production, sale, and uh, in a way consumption of ale was uh, quite regulated. And if anybody by a, a, a statute the size of ale, and if anybody actually broke the statute, then they were they were fined quite right. quite heavily. Uh, at the time of, of uh, William of Taunton's charter. A fine, a standard sort of fine for the for breaking the assize of ale in some way, depending on the severity of the way you breach the assize, uh, was uh, either twelve pence or six pence. Right, and uh, that would have been an awful lot of money. That, that was a great days, deal. Yeah. Of if you imagine that uh, a carpenter's wage, carpenter's daily wage. At that time, would be four pence wow. uh, a day, four mm. pence a day. Mm. Then twelve pence was quite a hefty yes. yeah. amount. What William did was to say, "All right, well, um, 
uh, we'll have a, a standard fine for breaches of the size of ale um, in Weymouth and that'll be fourpence. Uh, in fact, if you look at the uh, uh, court records, about 50% of, of uh, offences that came before uh, that particular court uh, was for breaches of the assize of ale. Right. Uh, either because it was bad, uh, because it had gone off, uh, or because of the way it was sold. Uh, ale wives, this is another aspect of town life that you were uh, referring to. Uh, ale wives were, or Brewsters, uh, were uh, people who kept ale houses, brewed the ale that they sold, uh, and uh, did all sorts of things. Um, they, the uh, ale was, was actually sold in things called bottles. Uh -huh. uh, a bottle was about two quarts, so these were huge jugs. Uh, and one of the things that they did uh, was to put pitch, which is readily available in a yes. place like Weymouth, into the bottom of the bottle, so you've got okay. about an inch and a half of pitch at the bottom, which right. solidified, so obviously. Yes, and then make and it so you in fill the, it up with ale. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a bit like the weights like, and measures of today. Exactly, absolutely, exactly, yes. Mm. Uh, so you find lots of uh, breaches of the size of ale coming before the courts. Uh, the, re the sort of reduction of the fine was uh, a quite a big thing. Another thing that uh, uh, the Weymouth Char William of Taunton's charter did was to, another sweetener, was to say, all right, ev everything the monastery buys in Weymouth for every 12 pence, Yes. we'll pay 13 pence, right. so that, that was a, uh, so that quite, money quite a good yes. deal. But as I say, these yeah. were, these were uh, sweeteners, and the point of the sweeteners was to actually attract people into the town that was being developed. So here so in, in Weymouth, when we're talking about the market, where we're sat now, this would have been the old marketplace. Uh, it, well, it was, yes. 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 Um, and we'll have some shots of, of that to, um, to show. So if we talk, still talk about Weymouth and religion just in this particular part, there was no chapel as such, was it? Weymouth was attached to Wyke Regis exactly. Church. And um, I believe there was a chapel of ease somewhere that was destroyed in the yes. Civil War. Uh, yes. Um, the, yes, Weymouth didn't become a parish until 1836. Right. Uh, so as you say, mm. it had... Uh, uh, a chapel of ease. Very difficult to uh, document. Mm. Um, so chapel the, of ease, just in case anyone doesn't know what it is, it just made it that there was somewhere that people was, locally could easily yeah, go to to worship. There was somewhere yeah. people could go to worship. Yeah. Um, the, the point was though that uh, if you were going to be if you were going to be buried uh, or if you were going to be married or uh, whatever other mm. uh, services the church provided, then you had to go to Wyke. Right. Uh, the a Chapel of Ease only did the sort of very basic things. Mm. The point there being that uh, uh, things like burials, marriages, uh, and so on, were sources of income for right. uh, for what the rector yes. of Wyke, yes. uh, who naturally was not keen to... Uh, no, he, he didn't want something um, set up here because he would have lost his income. Uh, yes, indeed. Mm. Uh, well, also, things like, uh, things called ob oblations, which were gifts to the church in order to get some kind of spiritual right. uh, benefit. Yes. Uh, yeah, so as you say, th there was a chapel of these. Um, difficult to document. Mm. Uh, it's known that there, there was a building uh, behind us. Yes. Um, Eventually, yes. In the uh, certainly in the fourteen in the fourteenth mm. century. Hence um, the name Chapel Hay. Chapel Hay, yes, mm. and Chapel Hay steps mm. and so on. Uh, so, yes, um, it, obviously its fortunes ebbed and, and yes. flowed, uh, and it was used, as you say, later for different purposes mm. like. Uh, uh, during the Civil War, uh, yes. um, 
Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, while we're still on the Weymouth side, um, if people have been to Weymouth, they may well, well have been down to um, Hope Square. And of course, yes. that would have, the water would have actually come right into Hope into Square, Hope Square yes. wouldn't it? Wouldn't yeah. have been like yeah. it is yeah. now. Yeah. 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 And that uh, would have been called an Ope. Am I correct uh, in saying ope, that rather yes. than, than Hope uh, Square? An Ope, yes. Mm. So if we now go over to the Malcolm Regis side, when did Malcolm Regis get their charter? In 1280. Right, so uh, that bit later. The, uh, the problem with uh, the Malcolm Regis charter is that the original one, the 1280 one, has been lost. Okay. Uh, as most of the documentation in medieval Malcolm Regis, Regis has been lost. But fortunately, uh, the the actual provisions of the 1280 charter were repeated in a later charter, okay. uh, a charter called an Inspeximus Charter, right. in 1318, in the reign of uh, Edward II. Mm -hmm. And that repeated all the provisions of the 1280 charter and uh, then added more. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the uh, 1318 charter is that it gives a lot of detail about the actual nature of the town. It names streets uh, and so on and so on. So it's much more uh, detailed than, than yeah. the Weymouth charter. Uh, in that respect. Mm. Uh, the Weymouth Charter uh, describes the, the town boundaries, mm. but uh, totally unrecognisable, totally unrecognisable yes. places. Uh, yeah. yeah. So in um, Malcolm Regis, or Weymouth now, we've got Bond Street and it says formerly Coneygar Lane. Yeah. So could you tell me a little bit what a Coneygar was, why it was called Coneygar Lane? Well, a Coneygar was a warren. <laughs> And it seems that uh, certainly uh, the, uh, in the later part of the 14th century, that part of the town was a Konigar, a warren, uh, an area which was uh, given over to breeding and managing uh, large, numbers of, large numbers of rabbits. Uh, the... Um, um, the land wasn't really very much use for anything else. Right. Uh, it's a, basically a sand spit. Uh, so uh, using it uh, uh, to farm rabbits essentially, that's yes. what it Except they weren't called rabbits, they were called cones. Yeah. Only the young were called rabbits. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was quite an important part of the, of the medieval economy of the town. Uh, rabbits were used as a winter food source. Uh, their skins were used to make hats, uh, to trim garments, um, this kind of thing. Uh, so uh, it was quite uh, a useful addition to have. Uh, to the to the town economy. So it sort of marked a boundary from the kind of the barren sand spit uh, lands yeah. in, into the town. Would yeah, you say? That's right. Yeah. The town, the Bond Street, the town ditch, mm. uh, the was w uh, actually the town ditch was probably uh, <laughs> the the boundary of the northern boundary of the town. When you cross the town ditch, I see. You entered you the town, okay. and when you therefore when you had crossed the ditch, you were subject mm. to the town, the borough court, things like this. Right. And to poss possibly uh, that was the point at which you began to incur tolls and uh, okay. regulations, it were. And what interests me greatly is the fact that you've got these two towns, Weymouth and Malcolm Regis, that were founded in medieval times, but they were both given the right to actually send two members to Parliament. Yes. And that I find extraordinary for such small areas because in other big cities, they only had the right to send one person or sometimes nobody. Why do you think that was? Well, this... Uh, this basically is how uh, the, uh, parliament, the parliamentary system worked at that time. Yes. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, representative democracy or anything like that. The, uh, the, in the Middle Ages, the, uh, mem the members uh, of the members of parliament were in effect selected. Uh, uh, either uh, by uh, 
sheriffs mm -hmm. uh, to attend certain parliaments, summoned to attend certain parliaments, or delegated by a town corporation like Malcolm Regis, say, uh, to attend certain parliaments. Um, and uh, like little tops of the system just grow. Right. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, both. Uh, both Weymouth and Malcolm Regis appear to have been sending uh, MPs to Parliament uh, before they were corporation, before they right. were borough. Right. But that's how it came about, a very sort of haphazard yes. uh, sort, sort yeah. of way. Um, because... Uh, and of course th that, that remained the case until parliamentary reform in the 19th century. Weymouth and Weymouth yes. still sent four MPs to Parliament right. uh, at that time when somewhere like Manchester yes. hadn't got any. <laughs> It's amazing, uh, isn't it, that, yeah. that, that small area? That, that, yeah, and that's... if we talk about sort of law and order of the time, it was very different, wasn't it, to now? You know, there's in your book, there's really interesting sort of little anecdotes about people doing wrongs. The one I, the one that I particularly like is the is the chap who puts the dung by the Chapel of Ease on Malcolm Regis side and is duly reprimanded. It's John Shudd, uh, who was probably an alehouse keeper. Yes. Uh, but he was done for all kinds of uh, things, not just depositing, uh, depositing dung, but uh, reaches of the size of hail, uh, breaking arrests. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, uh, uh, another I interesting case there is uh, 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 a man called William, uh, a man called William Tiley. Uh, I said earlier that uh, these towns at that time were quite violent. Mm. Uh, a man called William Tiley, uh, in some kind of dispute, pulled a dagger on a man called John Copeland. Uh, and went to court for it. Uh, the court arrested his arrested his dagger. That uh, was well, arresting him. Yes. Uh, that meant confiscated it. So uh, Tyler went to court. Uh, his dagger went to court, uh, and he was he was fined threepence uh, for the offence. Uh, and then. Uh, was told, okay, you can have your dagger back for eightpence, uh, and that was a way of, sort of using the court again. Yes, to, uh, yeah, they, and, and they were quite yeah. corrupt places, weren't they, they in those yeah, days? They were indeed, uh, <laughs> but uh, they did they did their best. Yes. Uh, yeah. Really? You see, this is what I find is one of the lovely things about your book, is the anecdotes, the people, the real people that are in the book, the fact that you've managed to find the names and what they did, it just brings it all to life. It's not just, um, you know, a history, da 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 the time was this, the time was that. It's the real people, and that's what captures the imagination, takes you to that place, um, that makes you live it. It's just so great that you've managed to find, and, and that must have been some effort to have found all that information out with those actual people. I know I've trawled through, you know, various things like British history online, looking for evidence for things. It must have been very, um, a lot of research gone into that. Uh, this is court records. Yes. Uh, that sort of material comes from yeah uh, but as I said earlier um, the the uh, medieval documents for Weymouth um, many 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 of them have been lost or thrown uh, thrown sad. away in fact. so sad uh, so as I don't think there's a lot no. that can be done about no, that. No. And of course, we can't talk about Weymouth and Malcolm Regis without talking about the Black Death, because oh, it's yes. thought that yes. um, the Black Death uh, uh, entered through the Malcolm Regis side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what's your views on that? Uh, the idea that, that Malcolm Regis was the sole uh, earliest point of entry of the Black Death is not something that I really buy into. I think there were quite obviously multiple points of mm. entry. Um, one interesting thing that I discovered is that um, the Archdeacon of, uh, at the time when uh, the monastic 
chroniclers uh, were saying that uh, this was the point at which the Black Death had entered mm. England through Malcolm. Uh, the Archdeacon of Bath and Wells uh, was writing to uh, his uh, clerics in and around Weymouth, uh, saying, uh, you know, take care of this great plague is coming from France. Oh. Is coming from France, not is already here. Right. Uh, so he obviously didn't know about it. No. Uh, whereas uh, the monks who were saying that uh, uh, Malcolm yeah. Regis was the point of entry were actually from King's Lynn or right. whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this had a major effect. The Black on, Death did, um, yes. Uh, and yeah. uh, yeah. As it did on everywhere. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the mortality rate was very very high, um, and uh, there's very very there are very few ways in which one can actually quantify it. Uh, one way is uh, to look at. Um, uh, bishops' registers, right. uh, what were called institutions, which is uh, changes of, of, of clerics in, in parishes, okay. uh, and to measure the impact of it in that way, and the, and the sort of duration of the first wave of, of, of the Black Day. Because it was pretty uh, indiscriminate, wasn't because, it? It would yes, kill uh, anybody. Yeah, mm. Yes, and of course, uh, of course, clerics were likely to be uh, fairly heavily exposed to it because yes. they oh, of course, ministered to death the last people. Rites, yeah. um, the Black Death. Um, now we know what it was. Yes. It was a disease called Yersinia pestis. Um, whether it, it, whether the really infectious part of it, aspect of it, was caused by rat fleas is, uh, who knows. Uh, but um, also it, it was transmitted person to person by uh, sort of coughing and things yes. like that. Uh, and that was... Uh, 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 sort of pneumonic plague, mm. uh, a, a sort of different version of it, and that was probably more infectious right, than, than the, 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 the rat-borne uh, mm. plague. Mm. It could possibly also have been transmitted by other things like lice and so on. Yes, yeah. people um, had lice. <laughs> and again, what's interesting is the resilience of human nature and the fact that you've got this awful plague going on. But for other people, it meant a change in fortunes oh, yes. in the fact that they could demand more for their services, yes. they could move to different areas and actually be paid more. So again, you've got this double-edged sword and, that, and then that created movement of people sort of more so throughout the country. Yes, the, um, yes, the impact of the Black Death uh, by reducing the population to the extent that it did meant that labour was valuable mm. uh, and people could sell their labour mm. uh, for more. So how did how was the woolen trade affected in Weymouth and Malcolm Regis? Because obviously wool was a big commodity as, lo as well as the wine and the ale. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the basis uh, of the prosperity of Malcolm Regis particularly was the wool trade. Mm. Uh, and uh, later, uh, the, later the, the cloth trade. Uh, both towns tra seem to have traded in both wool and wine, uh, but the emphasis uh, in Melcombe Regis was wool. Right. Uh, uh, not quite so sure that uh, the balance was that different in Weymouth. Uh, but um, yes. Um, so they would have exported across England and they would have also exported to France, presumably. Uh, it was the the uh, the wool and subsequently certain kinds of cloth uh, were exported to Europe. The wool often went to um, the Netherlands oh, okay. um, as distinct from uh, right. that yes. northwestern France. Uh, some of it uh, went to high quality woolen manufacturers in Italy. Wow. Uh, this this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
to a small town, a small port, that's like uh, Weymouth and Malcolm Regis yeah, were yeah. actually contributing a lot to the, to the economy. Uh, so yeah, as things started uh, to decline... It wasn't quite as uh, massive as uh, one might think. I mean, no. the, 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 actual, the actual proportion of, of wool that was shipped out of uh, south coast ports, other than Southampton, mm -hmm. was minimal compared with the amount of wool that was being shipped out of east coast ports, oh, like, okay. uh, like King's Lynn. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was. Th there's no real comparison between right. Weymouth no. and Malcolm and no. uh, somewhere like well, uh, well, Kingsley. So as it started to decline, so we've got the Black Death causing the decline of the towns, and then we've got the Hundred Years' War causing the decline. What kind of impact would that have then had? Because Weymouth had to provide ships for the Hundred Years. <coughs> So. Yes, um, it provided ships, uh, most famously provided uh, ships for the siege of Calais. Right. Uh, 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 purportedly uh, a, disproportionate amount, a disproportionate number of ships compared to, uh, let's say, Southampton or something like that. Um, but the main impact of the... Uh, of the Hundred Years' War on the ports, apart from the raids, which we've talked about, was the disruption of trade. Uh, and uh, that had uh, a very, very serious effect on uh, especially Malcolm Regis. Yes. So that by 1410, as a result of uh, uh, raids, as a result of the disruption of trade, as a result of uh, merchants being unwilling really to come to the, to yes. the ports, uh, or uh, moving off uh, to more secure ports like, let's say, Poole. Right. And, uh, that was having a very damaging effect. 1410, there appear to have been also massive uh, massive storms uh, which left at that time the town basically a wreck right. uh, and it took a long time for it to uh, to recover from that so it was hit by virtually everything uh, so it's amazing isn't it in that very short period of time you know 200 years or so we've got yeah. something that you know there wasn't even a, a proper church or anything we've got planned towns that are put there that deliberately grow, thrive, and then all of a sudden they decline very quickly. Mm. Yeah, so it's a very interesting part of history yeah. for Weymouth. And the people, at the, the, the actual people at the time, uh, especially the people in Malcolm Regis, uh, I'm talking now about mm. the Burgesses of Malcolm yes. Regis, uh, they put most of the blame uh, on the Hundred Years War. Right. Uh, on, uh, and the, uh, that was the main burden of uh, their petitions to the Crown to get the fee farm reduced and to get tax right. taxes yes. abated. Yes. They said it all the time. They said it, it's the hundred. It's, well, they didn't call it the Hundred Years War. It's, it's the war. Just the yeah. war that it was affected. And the costs yeah. of the war. Yeah. yeah. So if we look at um, medieval, what's left of medieval Weymouth and Malcolm Regis now, now the two towns have joined. Could you just tell us when it was that they, the two towns became Weymouth and joined as one? Uh, that's an, an interesting question. Because, yes. uh, in the 1570s, uh, the Crown tried to force them uh, to join together. Oh, OK. Uh, because they were causing, because their disputes were causing yes. so much trouble, <laughs> uh, and had been for years and years. Yes. Um, so uh, the crown tried to compel them to unite. Uh, uh, an act of parliament was passed called the Act of Union, which uh, forced them to unite. The problem was uh, they didn't abide by it. Ah, uh, right. They um, didn't want to do that. And. Uh, it took a long time, uh, and it took until uh, 1616, in fact, uh, the reign of James I, for the towns to have an effective united government. Uh. And of course, the other thing was they needed to be a 
physical link. Yes. Uh, and that came in the 1590s when the first bridge was built. Right. Uh, so that's when they really joined together. And that became. When we're thinking the, the 15. Modern day yeah, way yeah that became modern day way. Mm. So they, they still kicked and screamed it. <laughs> but uh, they had yeah, to go with yeah, it, they had yeah, no choice. They had to go with it, yeah. So if somebody were to visit Weymouth now, there'd be plenty of evidence of medieval life or the medieval buildings left here, wouldn't uh, there? Or the street plans? It's the, it's the, the, the actual street, street, street pattern yes. that's, the, that's the crucial okay, rather thing. than the buildings. Uh, the town was effectively completely... Uh, Re well, it, it had uh, a street system uh, imposed on it in the 1280s, uh, and that uh, that street system, the grid, s is still there, yes. exactly as it was when yes. it was. Uh, so when you're walking the streets of, of Weymouth, the then indeed, Melbourne yeah. Regis, yeah. you're walking the original yeah. street yes. plan. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the very popular and very pretty now St Albans Street was yes. at one time Petticoat Lane, and then prior to that, it was Baker, Baker Street. Street. Uh, yes. Um, uh, looking very closely at the 1318 charter and looking at how it describes uh, different plots of, of, yes. of, of vacant land. It's quite, well, a bit of ingenuity. It's quite possible to work out that uh, what's now St Albans Street was Weymouth's famous Lost Street, Baker Street. Right. Uh, that's, that's where it yes. went. Yes, yeah. 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 Fascinating. But yeah. the, the grid is the the grid is the important, That's the important thing. thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, St Thomas Street, St Mary Street, mm. the north south main yes. parts of the grid, uh, St Edmund Street and uh, Baker Street. Let's call it. Yes. Uh, the sort of east west parts of it. So what's interesting about the medieval grid layout in the, the now town of Weymouth, we spoke a little bit about St Albans Street and Petticoat Lane, and I believe you've got a great story to tell about you and your wife, Pauline, actually going and measuring the perches of the, of yeah. the tenements there. Yes. The thing about the grid is that it actually divides the town into blocks, uh -huh. uh, and each of, of the blocks contain uh, what we call uh, burgage plots, uh, tenements. And the idea was that these are long, thin plots. The idea was that the uh, frontage of the burgage plots should be obviously onto the main, onto the two principal yes. streets. Um, and uh, you've tried to maximise uh, the the available frontage as much as you possibly uh, as much as you possibly could. Uh, what's clear from the charter, uh, the 1318 charter, is that uh, a, a standard unit of measurement was used by the surveyors who actually laid out the town in the 1280s, and this was the medieval perch which is uh, 16 and a half feet. And when we were researching, uh, when we were doing the field work for the book, uh, one aspect of it that we decided to do was to try to work out uh, whether, uh, because property boundaries are the most long lasting of all sorts of boundaries, whether any of these frontages could actually be measured in terms of units or fractions yes. of the medieval perch. Yes. Uh, so we we went off uh, to do this at quiet at quiet times of day, uh, uh, going around with a line which was divided into uh, uh, sixteen and a half feet, um, half of sixteen and a half feet. Uh, and what we found actually was that uh, the, the central block which we measured, the width of which we measured uh, on, on Baker Street, St Albans mm -hmm. Street, was exactly eight perches. Right, right. Uh, so then we thought, well, uh, we'll have a look at frontages and yes. went around uh, trying to measure people's frontages. Uh, when we started, uh, people came out and asked us, you know, what are, we, what are you doing? I um, uh, thought you were maybe from the local authorities. Um, 
So we said, well, what we're trying to do is to establish whether or not we can measure your the frontage of your business in terms of the standard medieval perch. Yes. And they looked at as though we were from <laughs> another planet. <then. laughs> but you think that would be really interesting to know if you're using a building, yeah. whether it's your building or you're yeah. just running a shop, that would be so interesting to know that that yeah. would have been that. But it, it also shows when we're talking about town planning, this was so deliberate, you know, surveyors marking out yeah. the land. You yeah. just don't imagine that in medieval times, that that trouble was taken, those decisions were made. Very, very, sophist very, very yes. sophisticated. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, the people, the surveyors were known as, sometimes known as locatores. Okay. And were professionals. Yes, so, yeah. 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 Streets which were probably occupation lanes to the backs of tenements that okay. came off the main, yes. the main street. Uh, they uh, appeared, uh, certainly their names appeared in the 1370s. Uh, um, St Nicholas Street and Maiden Street. Uh, there's a, st <laughs> a story about Maiden Street that um, it uh, was so called after uh, Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. Okay. Um, but it was called Maiden Street in the 1370s, okay. so it can't have been that. No. And whoever the maid, whoever the maidens were who gave their name to Maiden Street, <laughs> they certainly weren't virgins. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's, yeah. a, I suppose, a bit like we have Love Lane on this side, yes, where we Love are Lane, in, yes, in that was Yes, yeah. 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 Well, Jim, it's been so fascinating. I can't tell you. I could talk to you all afternoon. I'm sure there's just so much more information that we could um, we could give our viewers. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. If people would like to purchase this book. We will be putting notes accompanying this show on where, they, <laughs> where it can be purchased. If you're in Weymouth, it can be bought at Books Afloat, at Charlbury Stores. Um, post office. And at the post office. Thank you. <laughs> and also it's obtainable from Amazon, but we'll put all that on our show notes. So once again, thank you very much thank indeed, you. Jim. Absolutely brilliant. I really loved reading this book. It just ticked all the boxes for me. Fascinating. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.